when I teach this concept in circuits one um, for the electrical engineers and the mechanical engineers and all that kind of jazz, I usually give them a significant amount of background information about how to calculate um, effective values of periodic waveforms and all of that kind of good stuff, which for the most part, you guys are going to be working with steady state sinusoidal systems in a practical sense, which means we're only going to focus our discussion on that. And luckily enough, the effective value or the RMS value for um, a voltage or current in a steady state sinusoidal system is simply the magnitude uh, of the sinusoid divided by the square root of two, which you guys may have been introduced to in uh, the Gill's class whenever you guys took that. Okay. So if you recall from what we had talked about previously in our review sessions, in the time domain, a voltage waveform could be represented as a sinusoid like so that has some particular magnitude and some particular phase angle. And similarly, a current could be represented by a similar sinusoidal waveform. These were our time domain representations. And we found that we could represent these in the frequency domain using phasers, where we kept the magnitude and kept the phase angle and threw everything else away. Oops, this should be an I. So this was our frequency domain representation. What we have been using up to this point. Today, when we are calculating powers, we are going to use an RMS phaser representation. So I'm going to denote an RMS phaser as opposed to a regular phaser by putting a squiggle over the top of it as opposed to just a straight line. Okay. So our RMS phaser voltage will simply be our phaser voltage divided by a factor of the square root of two. which will be Vm over the square root of two with an angle of theta V, or what we're gonna call V effective with an angle of theta V. And I can do a similar thing here for my currents. So I'm gonna have a phasor current I over the square root of two will be Im over root two angle theta I, or I effective angle theta. So I think it was maybe the first day of class where I asked what the voltage provided by the receptacles in this room is. And I got two answers. And I said that both of them were correct. Um, it was these two gentlemen here, Preston and this gentleman whose name I forget, maybe Gavin? Garrett. Okay. I don't remember which one of them said 120 volts and which one of them said 170 volts, and then some sinusoidal stuff, they are both absolutely correct. Um, the 120 volt representation is literally the effective value representation. So we use effective values, particularly in calculating complex powers, because quite honestly, multiplying a bunch of sinusoids together becomes incredibly tedious. Just the math behind it is ugly. We have to remember trig identities and stuff like that. And it's completely and utterly pointless for what we're looking for as power engineers, okay? So instead we use these effective values where the whole point of an effective value is that it represents the exact, uh, a DC signal 
that causes the exact same amount of power to be absorbed as the periodic AC signal does. So it's simply a shorthand DC representation of an AC signal. So complex power is a quantity that was developed by power engineers to really just contain all of the different information that you could want to know about the uh, given load, okay? So mathematically, complex power is simply S is equal to one half the phasor current, excuse me, phasor voltage V times the complex conjugate of the phasor current I, and then to get rid of this factor of one half, which comes about from applying trig identities, <laughs> excuse me, we can instead use our RMS phasor voltage and our RMS phasor current conjugate. Okay. So this is our frequency domain representation. And this is our RMS phasor domain representation. So calculating the complex power absorbed by any given load is as simple as finding the RMS phasor voltage across the load finding the RMS phasor current through the load, and then multiplying those two quantities together while remembering to take the conjugate of the current, okay? And just to refresh you guys, taking the conjugate of the current is simply changing the sign on the angle if we're in polar form, so. Um, the units of complex power, what do you guys think they are? What was that? A watt. So a watt would make sense, uh, but unfortunately you're wrong and you're wrong for a very, very simple reason, okay? So watts are what are used to measure average power, the uh, amount of power that is capable of performing work in a system. And we'll get to that in a moment. Um, so we're gonna see when we're dealing with complex power that there are three different parts of the complex power and in order to be able to differentiate between those parts, electrical engineers have just made up new units. Well, this is one of those cases where they made up units. So everything that you were assuming, voltage times current should give us watts. You're correct, but we call it a different unit just to make sure that we know we're talking about complex power. Okay. So the unit of complex power is the volt ampere. Okay. If you guys go to your local big box store um, because you're trying to buy a generator or something like that, uh, you'll probably see that it has two ratings on it. One rating will be expressed in watts and the other rating will be expressed in volt amperes. That's telling you the amount of average power that it can produce and the amount of complex power that it can produce. And those two quantities are related. So, since our complex power is simply the product of two complex numbers, we should expect that the complex power can be expressed as either a rectangular form complex number or a polar form complex number, okay? So if I multiply V times I conjugate, what is this gonna look like? Well, we're gonna have V effective angle theta V multiplied by I effective angle negative theta I, which is V effective times I effective with a phase angle of theta V minus theta I. This part right here, simply the product of V effective times I effective 
is what's known as the apparent power. Its symbol is the magnitude of S, the complex power, because that's exactly what it is. It's just the magnitude of the complex power with no phase angle information whatsoever. And it is measured in volt amperes. And so what the apparent power represents is really the power that's produced by the utility. Um, so there's no consideration of phase angle whatsoever. It's simply the product of voltage and current. So you can think of it as kind of a worst case scenario of what a particular load is going to draw. If the voltage and currents were exactly in phase, this would be what the, uh, the load would draw. This theta V minus theta I is what is known as the power factor angle. We're gonna talk more about power factor here in a little bit, um, but it represents the efficiency of power distribution in a system. Uh, the symbol for this is going to be theta S. So that our complex power can be expressed as having a magnitude and a phase angle because it's a complex number. So these are our polar form representations and the different pieces of information that are inside the polar form representation. Now we're gonna look at the rectangular form representation, right? So I'm gonna convert this polar form number into a rectangular form number using uh, trig identities here. So we're going to wind up having V effective times I effective cosine theta V minus theta I plus J V effective I effective sine theta V minus theta I, doing nothing more than using the identity to convert from polar to rectangular that we developed on the first day of class. Okay. This big part right here represents the average power. whose symbol is the letter P. You may also see this as P subscript average. And the units of average power are in watts. As I said previously, um, the average power is the portion of the complex power that is capable of performing work in a system. And then over here, we have what's called the reactive power. Its symbol is Q, and it has special units as well. Uh, the units of reactive power are the VAR, or volt ampere reactive. So when we're dealing with complex power, we have three different units. We have volt amperes, which represents the apparent power. We have watts, which represents the average power. And we have VARs, or volt amperes reactive, which represents the reactive power. So that if I give you a particular unit, you'll know which portion of the complex power that we're talking about. Okay. Um, reactive power is pretty interesting. Um, because it represents the portion of the complex power that is generated, sent to the load, and then immediately sent back over and over and over again. 
none of it is actually absorbed by the load. None of it is capable of performing work. And yet it is very critical to how our grid operates uh, because what the reactive power represents is temporary energy storage in inductances and capacitances, right? Um, so without being able to inject VARs into a system at will, um, our energy system would uh, suffer constant blackouts, okay? Uh, so VARs are incredibly important to keeping our grid up um, because it takes time and effort to effectively generate um, average power, whereas reactive power can be switched in and switched out simply by adding or taking out capacitors. Um, so you're going to, when you guys get into internships at places like uh, Entercon and Entergy, uh, maybe AEP and all of that kind of stuff, they're going to talk to you about um, static VAR compensators and things like that. Those are literally just really big capacitor banks that they can switch in and out of their networks in order to help ride through um, low voltage events that would cause blackouts and things like that. So reactive power is, a, like I said, a pretty interesting thing because it seems like it's not doing anything, but it's really critical to keeping the lights on and everything else everywhere in the world. All right, so um, let's see. I'm trying to think if I want to talk about power factor next or the power triangle, but I think we'll talk about power factor first. Okay. So, oh, actually, before I do that, in rectangular form, our complex power is simply then P plus JQ. Okay. So, I, I hit you guys with a whole lot of math things right here. I don't expect you guys to learn all of these equations. It's entirely unimportant if you took my suggestion and bought a not crappy calculator. Okay. So let me explain what I mean by that by summarizing these relationships really quickly. Okay. S is equal to V times I conjugate which is simply the magnitude of S with an angle of theta S or P plus JQ, average power plus reactive power, which means if you can multiply two complex numbers together in your calculator, if you get the answer in polar form, you know the average, or excuse me, the apparent power and the power factor angle, and if you get your answer in the uh, rectangular form, you have average power and reactive power. So there's no need to remember these big equations. Always simply calculate S and then take from S what you need. If you're looking for either rectangular or reactive power, make your answer show up in polar form and take the right part. If you need apparent power, make your answer show up in polar form and just take the right part. There's no need whatsoever to memorize all these dumb equations if your calculator can tell you all of the different parts within a couple of button presses. So let's work a quick example here before we move on to power factor to illustrate just that. Um, let me find an example. So let's say that I have the following circuit. I have 120 angle zero degrees volts RMS. Just as a heads up, if I give you volts RMS, that means that we are in the RMS frequency domain and we don't need to change anything, right? connected to some impedance ZA. I'll define what ZA is in a moment. Connected to some impedance ZB like so. Uh, 
and then connected to some impedance ZC. Like so. And I want us to figure out the average power absorbed by impedance ZA, the apparent power absorbed by impedance ZB, and the reactive power absorbed by impedance ZC, where ZA is 10 plus J8 ohms, ZB is 12 minus J3 ohms, and ZC is 8 angle 30 degrees ohms. So in order to calculate these quantities, I'm going to calculate S, the complex power. And so that's going to require me to know the RMS phasor voltage across A, the RMS phasor voltage across B, and the RMS phasor voltage across C. I'll also need to know the RMS phasor current flowing through A, the RMS phasor current flowing through B, and the RMS phasor current flowing through C. So does anybody have any thoughts on how I might solve for any of those things? Okay, so we could find the total current and then use current division to find the other two. All right, sounds great, let's do it. So if I want to find that current IA, that's going to be our 120 angle zero degrees volts RMS divided by the equivalent impedance that's connected to that voltage source, right? So what's that equivalent impedance going to look like? I'm not looking for a number here, just describe it. Absolutely right. So ZA in series with the parallel combination of ZB and ZC, 100%. Um, so now let's put this in a more mathematical form that we could put in our calculator. So to me, that's going to look like ZA plus ZB times ZC over ZB plus ZC. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to store ZA in my calculator as A, ZB in my calculator as B, and ZC in my calculator as C. So I can literally just enter it in just like that, right? So I'm going to say that 10 plus 8i is stored as A. 12 minus 3i is stored as B. And 8 angle 30 degrees is stored as C. Then I have 120 angle zero divided by A plus B times C over B plus C. And I get that to be 5.808 J three point five two five three zero amps RMS in polar form or six point seven nine seven 
angle negative 31.287 degrees amps RMS in rectangular form. And I'm just gonna make a little note here. I'm gonna store that in my calculator as X. So Matthew suggested that now we can do current division to determine IB and IC. He's absolutely correct. So let's go ahead and take care of that. So IB is just gonna be IA times one over ZB divided by one over ZB plus one over ZC. Or in my calculator, X times, let me do this right, one over B over one over B, oops. plus one over C. Which I get to be 2.861 minus J 0 0.216 amps RMS or in polar form. 2.867 with an angle of negative 4.311 degrees. And I'm gonna store this as Y. And similarly, I'm running out of room here, but I think I can sneak it in. We could say that IC is IA times one over ZC over one over ZB plus one over ZC. So that's X times one over C. Over one over B. plus one over C. You guys have a question? Giving me 2.948 uh, minus J 3.314 or 4.435, angle negative 48.348. All right, so Matthew, wonderful suggestion. We got all three of our currents based on what you told me to do. How do we get our voltages? Yeah, absolutely right. So just use Ohm's law. Now that we know all the currents, finding all the voltages is trivial. We just multiply it by the associated impedance. Great suggestion. So we could say that VA, uh, and actually while I'm at it, I'm gonna store this last current as Z. So VA is simply IA times ZA. So that is in my calculator X times A eighty six point three two one plus J eleven point one six nine volts RMS. 
four. Eighty seven point zero four zero. Angle seven point three seven three. Degrees. Um, <laughs> while I have that in my calculator here, I'm going to go ahead and calculate S A. Okay. So S A, my complex power is V A times I A conjugate. So for me, I'm just going to do second answer times the conjugate, and our calculators can do the conjugate operation for us, of IA, which I have stored as variable X. And I get 461.953 plus J369.563. Volt amperes in rectangular form. 591.589 angle 38.660 degrees volt amperes in polar form. So while we're here, we're trying to figure out what the average power is. What is it? I disagree. The 591.589 is the apparent power. I want the average power. The 461.953. So PA, we just take the real part of the rectangular form. So 461.953, and we need to give it the right units for average power, which is the watt, right? We didn't have to do V effective times I effective times the cosine of the difference of the angles or anything like that. We can just calculate S and then take the part we want. Yes, sir. So for the TI calculators, um, if you hit second and then the pi button to go into the complex menu and you scroll down to option six, it literally says conjugate. So let me get the Casio out of my bag. <clears throat> so you have the 115 if I'm not mistaken. So with your calculator in complex mode, Press shift two to bring up the complex menu and then press two again where it says conjugate. For those of you with the Casio 991, in complex mode, press the option key and scroll down until it says conjugate. Which I need to put this one in complex mode real quick. Option, so conjugate is just option key and then number two. All right, so now let's, sorry, I don't know what happened to this. Apparently my cable or this cable is being weird. There we go. So let's look at uh, finding VB. Once again, using Matthew's suggestion, we're just gonna use Ohm's law. So that's IB times ZB, in my calculator, that is Y times B. Thirty-three point six seven nine minus J eleven point one six nine. 
or in polar form. Thirty-five point four eight three with an angle of negative. Sorry, there shouldn't be a J there. Uh, negative eighteen point three four eight. So while I have this in my calculator, I'm going to calculate SB. So that's simply going to be VB, which is my current answer, times IB conjugate. So second answer times the conjugate of IB, which I have stored as Y. I get 98.748. Minus J, 24.687. Well, Ampere's, excuse me. And in polar form, this looks like 101.788. With an angle of negative 14.036 degrees. I'm trying to find, let me scroll up here, the apparent power. Yes. Yes, sorry, thank you for that. You're, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, I'm solving for voltage, so these should be in volts RMS. Thank you. So which of these four numbers is the apparent power? The 101.788, absolutely. And my units are in volt amperes because we're dealing with an apparent power. All right, finally, we have to find VC, which is just gonna be IC times ZC. Uh, in my calculator, this is going to look like Z times C. Thirty three point six seven nine angle negative eighteen point excuse me negative eleven point one six nine. Nope, mixing my things up minus J eleven point one six nine volts RMS or thirty five point four eight three angle negative eighteen point three four eight degrees. Well, it's RMS. The exact same thing as VB. Does that make sense? Of course, VB and VC are in parallel, so they have to have the same voltage over them. Uh, from here, SC is simply VC times IC conjugate. So second answer times the conjugate of Z. One thirty six point two nine five plus J seventy eight point six nine zero or in polar form one fifty seven point three eight zero angle. 30 degrees volt amperes. We can actually make a pretty quick and interesting observation here. Um, the angle of the impedance, which in this case was simply 30 degrees, 
will also always be the angle of the complex power or our power factor angle uh, because they're both simply theta v minus theta i. So anyway, um, for this one, we are looking for the reactive power. So which of the four numbers is it? The 78.690, yep. And the units of reactive power are volt amperes reactive. Okay. So another reason why I encourage you guys to buy these calculators is because when we're doing all of this math, calculating power in these single phase systems, and also doing all the math that we'll do for calculating the power in three phase systems, if we can easily go back and forth between a rectangular form complex number and a polar form complex number, we don't have to remember all of those relationships. Okay. All right, so let's take a few moments here and talk about the concept of power factor. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, power factor of an electrical system is a measure of the efficiency at which uh, power is distributed. Okay? So mathematically, power factor, PF, is simply the ratio of the average power P to the apparent power. This is the same thing as the cosine of our power factor angle, okay? So let's talk about a couple of things here really quickly, right? We as a consumer pay for the average power that we use. That's literally what's on our utility bills and it's what's on the utility bill of any large scale industrial site or anything like that as well. The apparent power S is what the utility is generating and it costs them some amount of money to generate power, either by putting in the infrastructure for a hydroelectric plant or something like that, or literally buying coal to burn in a large portion of electric utilities here in the United States, okay? So average power is what we as the consumer pays for. Apparent power is what the electric utility pays to produce, okay? They want this number to be as close to one as possible or this ratio to be as close to one as possible, right? Because that means nothing is getting wasted. If this number is far away from one, and that could be on the order of, um, so typically speaking, the electric utility wants an individual consumer's power factor to, to be, in some instances, 95% or higher. Uh, some utilities, it's 97.5% or higher, but effectively, they want it to be real close to one. At some large-scale manufacturing plants where there are lots of induction motors, um, that number can be closer to 80% or lower, which means that a large portion of the power that the electric utility is creating actually gets immediately sent back to them, not a particularly efficient system, okay? Um, when we have class on Thursday, we are going to talk about the concept of power factor correction, which is what um, industrial consumers do to fix or correct their power factors to avoid fines imposed on them by the utility for having their system being too inefficient, okay? But mathematically, power factor, simply the ratio of average power to apparent power or the cosine of the power factor angle. Those two things are identical to each other, right? So because our power factor is related to the cosine function, what does that mean it can range? Like what values can the power factor have? From one to negative one. Yep. 
where one means that you're absorbing power with 100% efficiency. Negative one means you're supplying power with 100% efficiency. And everywhere in between means you have some amount of inefficiency. Okay. So um, let's see here. Power factors are classified as either leading or lagging. Um, and this depends on the sign of the power factor angle. So when zero degrees is less than, our power factor angle is less than 180 degrees. Effectively, if our power factor angle is positive, we say that our power factor is lagging, okay? What this really means is that the current is lagging the voltage across our load or that we have some inductance in our system. When zero degrees is greater than theta S is greater than negative 180 degrees, meaning that our angle is negative, our power factor is leading meaning that our current is leading our voltage and we therefore must have some amount of capacitance in our system. Okay. Um, so let's take this example. We worked here. And let's calculate the power factor at which our source was supplying power. Okay. So we have our source here, 120 angle, zero degrees, volts RMS. And we know the current that's flowing into the negative polarity terminal. So I argue that we can calculate the complex power supplied by this source. It's just going to be that 120 angle zero degrees volts to RMS times the complex conjugate of IA. Another way that we could look at this would be, well, whatever complex power is absorbed by these three loads has to be what the source is supplying. Those should be the same numbers, and we can verify that here pretty easily. So let's do that just really quickly. Um, so I'm going to throw a line down here. So S for our voltage source, I am saying is our source voltage times the conjugate of IA. So that's 120 angle zero degrees times the conjugate of what I have stored as X. 696.997 plus J423.566 volt amperes um, in polar form. That looks like 815.606. With an angle of 31.287 degrees. Just for fun's sake, let's add SA, SB, and SC together because it should equal the exact same thing, right? So SA. 461.953 plus 369.563i. SB 98.748 minus 24.687i. 
SC 33.697. Sorry, that is not right. I was adding the voltage, not the power. I need to make sure I didn't make that mistake in any of the other things. Nope, okay. Uh, SC 136.295. Plus 78.690i. And we get 696.996 plus J423.566. VA. It's the same thing. It has to be. Total power absorbed has to equal the total power supplied, right? So, okay, so two different ways that we figured out how much complex power our source is supplying. Now, we need to figure out our power factor. So how can we figure out our power factor from the information that we have provided here? And there are also two different ways we can do this. The 696.997 over the 815, absolutely. What's the other way? Well, here's theta S, yeah. We already have theta S. So we can just do that. I So whoever suggested that we can do the 696 um, over the 815, you're 100% correct. There's nothing remotely wrong with that whatsoever. My only concern there is that using that method, we can't actually determine whether or not the power factor is leading or lagging because the angle isn't there, right? And we can see right here that what the magnitude of the angle is tells us whether or not we have a leading or lagging power factor. And we need to know that too. So I would take that second suggestion, our power factor, is just going to be the cosine of 31.287 degrees. So what I'm going to do, uh, I'm going to store this complex number, the um, 815.606 angle 31.287. I'm gonna store that in my calculator as variable T. The reason why I'm doing that is because my calculator can return the angle so that when I do cosine of the angle of T, it's going to give me the most exact representation, 0 0.855, or, yeah. And is this power factor leading or lagging? It's lagging because the angle was positive. Just for those of you with the Casios, um, if you go, uh, if you have the Casio 115, shift two, and then option one where it says ARG, that is the argument of a complex number. That just is a fancy word for the angle. So that's what returns the angle of a particular complex number. If you have the Casio 991s, hitting the option button, and then option one, where it says argument, is how you get just the angle of the complex number. All right, so the last thing that I wanna talk about here today is the power triangle. And the power triangle is nothing more than a simple graphical tool that helps you remember how all of these things are related to each other. So if we were to plot the complex power of a particular load on the complex plane where the positive axis is real, or excuse me, the horizontal axis is real numbers and the vertical axis is imaginary numbers. Um, let's just say this 
represents our complex power S. The projection of the complex power onto the real axis is our average power. The projection of our complex power onto the imaginary axis is our reactive power. The length of this vector is our apparent power. And the angle formed between our complex power and the positive um, real axis is our power factor angle. So this triangle literally shows us how all of the different parts of the complex power are related to each other. Again, summarized by S is equal to magnitude angle phase angle or P plus JQ, showing us the exact same things, but in a graphical representation. So if we're ever given a power triangle, which you might be given for different things, you can tell just by looking at it whether it's going to operate at a leading power factor or a lagging power factor as to whether that angle is positive or negative, things like that. So all of the information that's buried inside the complex power is just graphically represented in this power triangle. Okay. All right, so uh, I think that's enough out of me for today. Um, we do have an in-class assignment, which I printed out and then left in the printers across the street at Neskin Hall. So I'm going to go run and grab those for you guys real quick. Uh, and I'll be back in just a moment.